if you look at a lot of the players of the biodiversity informatics initiative game, um, a lot of the players are global players. There are frequently national and regional and local players as well. Sometimes it can be scary how much the global players are driving the bus. And I've already mentioned to you in a previous talk that everybody comes into the game with his or her own set of motives. Okay? And some of those motives are good, and some of those motives look good, and some of those motives aren't good. So, I made the comment earlier that either you take care of your own interests or nobody will, right? You meaning your country, or maybe your institution, or your region, or your taxon, but you in some nebulous sense need to take control of your own destiny. And so this, this talk is a body of work that Jorge Soberon and I have been playing with off and on over the last several years. But it's essentially about can we develop biodiversity uh, diagnostics that speak at something finer and something more detailed than the global level. And in particular, think about the CBD, where each country that signed on that line, the US doesn't have to worry about this, but each country that did sign on that line said, we're going to keep track of our progress in taking good care of our biodiversity. And yet, there aren't many good metrics out there. There aren't many good protocols for getting that information. So let's, let's think about this a bit. CBD entered into force in 1993. The objectives are conservation of biological diversity, sustainable use of the components, and fair and equitable sharing of the benefits. Okay, all very noble. Um, ideas. The Aichi biodiversity targets, you've heard about this of course, address the underlying causes of biodiversity loss, reduce the direct pressures on biodiversity, improve the status of biodiversity, enhance the benefits to all, and look at this, enhance implementation through participatory planning, knowledge management, and ca capacity building. So these are all things that I can pretty much get, a, get into, right? Those are noble goals. And then we look at, well, what are the metrics that are being used? Okay, so let's look at this one. I'm gonna give you two examples. The first is the Living Planet Index, okay? So the Global LPI declined by about 30% between 1970 and 2008. LPI reflects changes in the health of the planet's ecosystems by tracking population trends of more than 2,500 vertebrate species. It's like a stock market index. So basically, we've gotten 30% worse. If we started with $1,000, we now have $700, right? And then we can break it down a little bit. Here we get it by continent. You know, North America's getting better and the Atlantic is getting better and Asia's kind of not doing much. Southeast Asia is going to hell. Um, South America's in a bad way. Uh, the Indian Ocean's in a bad way. Okay, so we just took the planet and we divided it up into really big pixels. Right? Six of them, seven of them. 
Now, what are the, what's the Living Planet Index based on? Okay, yeah. So here's a good example. The European otter in Denmark. And I'll give you one little clue about biodiversity. When you see something that's Lutra Lutra, it was usually described by Linnaeus, right? Because he just said, well, it's an otter, it's an otter. So serious population declines in the 60s and 70s. So out here it went like this. But improved water quality and control of exploitation from 1984 to 2004, look at that, more otters. Okay, so this would be something that helped push Europe up, right? Because Denmark is happy. Vertebrates are happy in Denmark. Here's wandering albatross populations in South Georgia, in the South Atlantic. Steady decline since 1972, believed to be from incidental mortality and fishing industry. And look at that, it's just going <laughs> Here's another bad one. Western Atlantic Ocean, bluefin tuna. Who's had sushi recently? Right? Confess. I love tuna, but uh, unsustainable fishing. And so we see from the 70s to present, and it goes way down and it kind of bottoms out. It's not going to go extinct, but it's not very good either. So we can do things like look at the temperate zone versus the tropical zone. So the poleward portions of the planet versus the middle belt. And we see, oh wow, the temperate zone is actually getting a little bit better. But the tropics are getting worse. And so those tropical countries have dragged the whole planet down and we've lost 30% of our living planet index. Then we can break it up by realms. In the Arctic, the Palearctic, the Neotropical, and the Afrotropical. And you can see the same thing. Those of us in the north are, are being good. And those of you in the south <laughs> are not. All right, look at that, the Neotropics. What a mess. But also look at the number of species involved. All right? Start, the first report started with 1,300 species. The most recent report has doubled. Okay, so the Living Planet report, the first one, 1,300 species, the most recent one doubled. Okay, these are vertebrates. Now, where are these studies principally done? Where do you have long-term population studies of a vertebrate? Are there any that have been done over 20, 30 years in Benin? If there are, there aren't many. But you know, we had a former faculty member at KU who the same guy monitored, the, monitored snake populations a few miles north of, of where I live for 60 years, nonstop, until he just passed away recently. Um, the density of Living Planet Index studies in the developed world, North America, Europe, Australia, there's probably a, a fair density here thanks to some people that are walking around the room. Um, but a lot of that tropical belt around the world doesn't have a whole lot of information. Let's do a different global assessment of biodiversity status. Let's take the red list index. Okay, remember the initiative game. A lot of this is new and improved. We have an index that tells you about the health of your planet's biodiversity. So we have the IUCN red lists, and basically the red lists are based on expert opinion. 
you get the people who know primates. Let's say the primates of Africa. And they all sit around and muse on and review data about the primates of Africa. And they say, well, gosh, you know, three out of the remaining five populations of such and such have been lost and they're cutting the forest near a fourth. That species is critically endangered. This other species is not in any, in any threat. Okay, so that's kind of how you get to these status decisions. Um, they have a very nice rubric for how you make those decisions and what, can, what constitutes what level of threat. But it's basically expert-based, and I have no problem with that. So they have critically endangered, endangered, vulnerable, and you know, there's a reduction in population size, size of range, small and declining population, or the potential for a quantitative analysis. And so there are all sorts of kind of notes about what qualifies and what doesn't. And the experts put this information together and look at it with a critical, knowledgeable eye and come to a status decision. Well, what the red, red list index is as a metric of biodiversity health is um, the idea of doing an assessment of, let's say, the status of the birds of the world in 1990 and then doing it in 2000 and saying, well, how many birds went from vulnerable to endangered or endangered to critically endangered or critically endangered to extinct versus how many birds, species, went from critically endangered to vulnerable or from vulnerable to no threat. So essentially it's this tally of whether on balance the X of the world, the amphibians of the world, the mammals of the world, the birds of the world are moving that direction or moving this direction. So this is essentially what we get for the red list index. We get overall that yes, the earth is in bad shape. And here we've lost about, what, 5% of our investment instead of 30% of our investment, but you can see it coming down, right? The world stinks if you're biodiversity. You can also break it up by regions, neotropical realm, afrotropical realm, Australasia, Palearctic, and you can see that the Indo-Malayan realm is the worst off, and the neotropics seem to be doing best. Look at it a different way with species survival. The Nearctic is doing well, the Indo-Malayan is declining, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there are lots of ways of kind of processing these data. And then we get to, okay, how do we choose who are the red list authorities? Who makes the decision about which species is endangered versus threatened versus no threat? And you can see the, the distribution of um, species amongst threat categories over bunches of groups, but you can also see the fairly limited set of groups that this is based on. You know, if we're talking the marine realm, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. If we're talking the terrestrial realm, we've got basically terrestrial vertebrates minus reptiles, and we've got cycads. Okay, so this is Again, we're talking a pretty small sample of biodiversity. Sorry, yes, sir. So there's a huge... Um, Hold on one sec. In terms of... Um, <laughs> Sorry. In terms of threat categories, there's a huge drive to actually push species up into 
the next highest threat category that you um, that you want. And so critically endangered has been in its present definition for how many years? Any offers? Is it 20 years? Something now? like that. 20 yeah. years. And critically endangered means that there's a 50% chance of going extinct in 20 years. Yeah. So? And they haven't. Yeah. <laughs> So we haven't actually done any conservation interventions for vast numbers of critically endangered species. So according to the definition, we assessed that they would be extinct. A not bunch of them be should be extinct, yes. Yeah. But they're not. Yeah. So all yeah. that is saying is that the threat categories are a load of rubbish. Because <laughs> See, I'm not the only thing, the only person who can say things that are incendiary. <laughs> the, um, the, you know, the, 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 the misclassification is bad. Yeah. You. And the mixture of motives. Hmm? You know, if, if you want to preserve Table Mountain, then the more species on Table Mountain that are in that critically endangered category, the more you can say, look, we have to preserve Table Mountain. Yeah. But then the Red List Index people come along and they're looking at it and they're, they're seeing, oh, it looks like Southern South Africa is doing pretty poorly, but what they're really seeing is your politicking. Yeah. So, so um, Tanya was talking yesterday about people who come to her you know, for um, mm -hmm. fight their causes. One of the causes that I have to fight for is, is having species declared critically endangered, push them up, sort of, you know, sort of yeah. you know, go these extra miles to actually get the species endangered. Right. So, so we can get funding yeah. for doing yeah. research on the species. That's all about smoke and mirrors. Oh yeah, <laughs> right with you. <laughs> well, I think there has, to be, there has to be serious problems with those uh, threat categories. And somebody has to, uh, has to do this expose that, uh, that not enough of the critically endangered species have gone extinct. So yeah. they couldn't have been critically endangered. Yeah, yeah. Conservation isn't that effective. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's keep going. So I've given you two of the dominant current biodiversity indicators. Okay, cited in the the CBD reports and such. And there are a bunch of things I want to point out to you about them. Perhaps the most important is the coarse spatial resolution. Did I show you anything that went down to a country level? Okay, except for something like Australia where the country is a continent, right? But we never got down to the level of, of, of Ghana or of the DRC. In both cases, I showed you, it's a pretty trivial sample out of what is biodiversity. Pretty hard to extrapolate from a thousandth of one percent or a tenth of one percent to the whole. Any bias in there, any absence of reality can magnify into a, a huge error in in perception. This is one of the most important ones. 